Welcome to Professor Messer's free CompTIA A Plus certification training course. This module is on SATA drive technology. I'm your host, James Messer, and in this module, we're going to learn about a couple of things from the CompTIA A Plus certification test number 220 601, section 11, where we need to identify the names, purposes, and characteristics of storage devices. In test 220 602, also section 11, is where we need to add, remove, configure personal computer components. And I'm going to show you how that's done with SATA drives, which is a relatively new drive technology on the market. We're going to learn what SATA is. We're also going to learn about the type of cabling that SATA uses, because it's a very different cabling than any other hard drive type. The interface that's used, which is also very different. You're going to like SATA a lot. And this SATA drive and what's on the back of a SATA drive. We'll also talk about best practices and things you need to be aware of when using SATA drives on your systems. SATA stands for Serial AT Attachment. And if you have familiarity with older types of hard drives, you know that they used to be called ATA drives. They're now called Parallel ATA drives. And that's because this new standard came along called Serial ATA. The SATA drive is one that is very fast, not something you think about when going serial. You used to think that serial meant that it was slower. But in hard drives and the way the technology has evolved, this latest generation is found in a much faster format on both consumer and professional enterprise type environments. You're going to find this inside of servers. You're going to find it inside of every consumer component. The latest laptops these days have SATA drives in them. And right now, there are two different flavors of SATA. There's a SATA slash 150 and a SATA slash 300. And this refers to the speed. Really, it's a format that is referring to the speed, where the speed transfer speed of these drives is 1.5 gigabits per second and 3.0 gigabits per second. That's a lot of speed moving back and forth to a drive. So you can see now why the SATA format was so nice for people, because they needed faster drives moving a lot more information. In my case, I have SATA drives in the systems I use, because I work a lot with this audio and this video system. So I need to move a lot of data as quickly as possible. And SATA is the format that does that for me. We've already talked about the SATA format as having faster speeds and that serial format providing us with faster technology. But it also has thinner cables. If you're used to some of the big flat ribbon cables that were on the original ATA or PADA drives, then when you start plugging in the SATA connection, you're going to see that it's this tiny little cable. And that's because it's serial. You only need a connection going to and a connection going from, generally speaking. I'm simplifying it a lot, but that's why the cable is so much smaller. That means we also get better airflow through our system. This is, can be a much longer cable. With PADA drives, you are very limited on how far the cables could be from the motherboard. And sometimes you didn't have a cable long enough. Now your SATA drives, the cables can be pretty long, which means that anywhere in that system you can plug in some drives. Makes it a lot easier when you're managing these new drives and these new systems. This is also a single cable. You plug into the motherboard. You plug into the SATA drive. There's no master and slave. There's no multiple cables or multiple devices per cable. It's a single cable with a motherboard and or a controller, really, you can think of it that way, and a drive on it. It's very simple to plug in. And that makes it very easy to manage whenever you're troubleshooting these systems. This SATA format also supports something called hot swapping. And what that means is that I can have multiple drives in a system. And if one goes bad, while the system is turned on and running, I can actually disconnect that drive from power and from the data put a new drive in the system, and plug it back in again. Usually this is done with a drive that's meant to be automatically pulled out and slid back in again in a chassis type system with these, these drive rails that pull in and out. It's intended to work that way. And that's really useful in enterprise environments where you have multiple drives inside a system. And often those drives are some have a level of redundancy associated with them. So those systems will continue to run even if they lose a drive. We're going to learn a lot more about that when we talk about RAID technologies in a future video. But that's a, a really nice format of this SATA is that it is part of the standard to be able to hot swap those drives. 
I mentioned the interface is very different. And this is a close-up of a motherboard that has SATA interfaces on them. You can see that what's nice here is we can do a comparison. This is a traditional PATA, ATA, or as it's called in this motherboard, an IDE connection. These 40 pins. We were looking at this in a previous video where we talked about the PATA standard. Now, those pins are there. And that's what we would plug in that would allow us connections to a master and a slave drive, so up to two uh, systems, two drives could be connected to this one interface on our motherboard. With SATA drives, notice the interfaces are much smaller. And it's good because we need one interface for every device, remember, that we're plugging into. SATA 1, SATA 2, SATA 3, and SATA 4 are on this motherboard. Some motherboards will support up to 8 or 16 or even more SATA ports per motherboard. That's a lot of drives you'd be plugging in. Generally, that'd be a motherboard that was really designed to be a server type environment or to store data in that environment. But this is nice. I have these four ports. They take up a tiny little bit amount of space. It really takes up less space than two of the traditional IDE connectors would be on the motherboard. And so there's some value in having that format available too, especially when we talked about airflow and real estate in a system. Here's a good comparison of the cabling. Here's a close up of the end of one of those IDE or PATA type ribbon cables. You can see the long cable. The pin 1, notice that pin 1 always has this red marking or color associated with it. And it takes up all this room to send that data. On the right side is a SATA cable. Look how small that is in comparison. So this, when we talk about airflow and moving air through a system and keeping things cool, or really just working with cables inside a system, this is so much easier. If you've ever been used to working with ribbon cables and they're really long and there's a small amount of space inside of a machine, you have to fold them up and somehow clip them together without damaging the cable or somehow tying them up so they're out of the way. A lot of that goes away now because now it's very easy to manage this much smaller SATA cable. The SATA drive itself also has similar connections on it. I've got my four pin power connection, my traditional power connection on this side. A lot of people call that the Molex power connection. I've got some jumpers on this particular drive that are used for different things. And we can look at the documentation for this SATA drive to learn more about what those are used for. I have this data connection. That's this tiny little connection on this drive. This big long connection, that's for power. That's a SATA power connector that's on this drive. Notice the data connection takes up this tiny little spot in comparison to just the power. In fact, these powers can be used independently. They should be used independently. You can plug into this power connection, or you can plug into this power connection, but not both. You don't want to do both on this particular type of drive. And But you've got an option here. Most of the drives these days have that option because not all power supplies are designed to provide you with this style of power connection. A lot of the newer power supplies do. So you'll see that on some of those. Here is what this uh, on the drive itself is some nice documentation. This is something that's a best practice. If you aren't quite sure what's on this drive, you can pull the drive out of the system and look on the top of it. And it has the documentation of it right there on the top piece of it. In fact, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. You can see a little better that the master slave jumpers that are here, you don't use them for SATA. That's why you didn't see anything connected to those jumpers on my drive. If you jumper pins 1 and 2, it enables something called spread spectrum clocking. And your motherboard's got to support that type of clocking in your system to be able to use that. If you jumper pin 5 and 6, it enables this drive not to be a SATA 300, which is what this drive's intended to be, but it slows it down in case you're plugging it into an older system that only supports the original SATA 150 standard. And so you can use this drive, even though this is a SATA 300 drive, I can slow the drive controller down so that it will work with the motherboard I happen to have. Notice that it does indeed say, use either the SATA power or the legacy power connector. Do not use both. It will result in damage to this hard drive. That's something I want to be very careful about when installing these systems. So on my system, when I was ready to connect the SATA drive, I plugged in my SATA controller. And you'll notice there's a key on it. So you can't plug it in upside down. It only plugs in one way, which is helpful when it's crammed in the back of a machine and you're trying to feel your way around and look around the cable. Well, that makes it easy. I can plug it in and I know it's in the right way. And there's my power connection, which is also keyed. You cannot plug a power in the wrong way either. If you're, you're managing, if you're finding it's really hard to plug those in, you can bet you're plugging it in the wrong way. Do not force anything on the back of these systems. They're keyed to slide right in there very easily. And now your SATA drive's plugged in. It's that simple. 
There's some nice best practices we should think about when using SATA drives or really any drive in general. I talked about this in a previous module. Make sure you use all the screws. These drives are spinning very quickly at thousands of revolutions per minute. We've got fans inside of our systems. And we want to be sure that these systems are locked down. We don't want our hard drives to be moving around because the heads on these drives are floating just above the, the distance of those platters. If there was the size of a hair in there, it would get in between. It would create a problem. So you don't want there to be any jostling of the system. So make sure you use all the screws. Don't shortchange yourself by only putting in one or two screws because it looks like it's installed properly. You also want to be sure that we're plugging in and making sure that the connection's going point to point. It's much easier now. There's an, unlike an IDE or a traditional PADA drive, you don't have to worry about a master slave. And in fact, the drive we were looking at, we didn't even have to worry about any of the jumper connections. We just plug it into the SATA connection, plug it into the power, and we're done. Also, if you happen to get a message saying operating system not found or something similar to that, make sure your cables are tight. Make sure you've plugged everything in. Because often when these things move from place to place or it's sitting in one place for a long period of time, there's vibration from the drives and from the fans. And they can sometimes jostle some of those cable connections out of there. So as you boot your machine up, as the BIOS is going through all of the components that it finds in the system, you can look and see if it's finding the drive. And if it's really a problem where the operating system isn't written to the drive, or the problem is that it's just not seeing a drive at all. And that's a good place to go, is in that basic input-output system of your computer. In review, we've talked about the SATA format, the serial ATA format. We've seen how simple it is to cable these things up in the single connection from the motherboard to the drive itself. And we've seen the interface and how it's keyed and how the drive connects to all of those. And finally, we went through a few best practices you should think about when mounting these drives in your systems and turning them on for the first time. If you'd like to comment on this video, you'd like to see what other people are talking about in our discussion forums, or you'd like to see what's added to our A-plus wiki, feel free to visit our website at freeaplus.com.